skills and an arbitrator at the Court of Arbitration for Sport, uh, and also an Olympia. Celia advises on compliance, sports law, sustainability, and human rights. She develops compliance programs and gives lectures on all those issues. I, I also uh, want to say that prior to becoming a lawyer, Celia was a labor court judge and the labor, uh, at the labor court in Offenbach in Germany and the city council responsible for legal affairs for women and health in, in Frankfurt on Main. We have also Cameron Myler, who is a clinical assistant professor in New York University's Tisch Institute for Global Sport, where her teaching and research is focused on legal and governance issues and Olympics and international sport. She competed in four Olympics, if I'm not mistaken. And after retiring from sports career, she turned into practice in law for a decade in the New York City. Cameron is also an arbitrator and has heard cases before the American Arbitration Association as well as the Court of Arbitration for Sport. And last but not least, we have Dr. Anna Kazmenka, who is a partner at Dispute Resolution and Sport Groups in Zurich office of Schellenberg Whitmer. Uh, she holds LLM and PhD degrees. Having practiced in Russia, France, and the US, Anna represents states and private entities in high profile international disputes including complex litigations, commercial and investment arbitrations. She's recognized as one of the top international lawyers of her generation and has been named as one of the most highly regarded individuals by his who legal. I feel truly honored and humbled to moderate this panel today. My name is Jan Kalish. I'm counsel and advocate at a Russian law firm, Rebalkin, Gerson, Jan and Partners. So to kick off today's discussion, Shall we start from highlighting the key differences uh, between the sports arbitration and regular commercial arbitration? Anna, would you like to start the discussion on this topic? Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Jan, for your introduction. Uh, really thank you for having me uh, to participate in this event. It's a great pleasure uh, also to share the panel with those who have been truly involved in the sports before uh, and, can, and can show their, um, can, can share their feedback on all the issues uh, we are going to discuss today. Um, I'm coming from the pure uh, lawyer's legal background. And as Jan already mentioned, I do uh, both commercial and sports arbitration. And of course, would be happy to share uh, my experience uh, in terms of the difference between the both. Um, so to keep it short, I think, you know, in general arbitration is arbitration and there are a lot of similarities between sports and commercial arbitrations, but there are also a number of differences that we can discuss today. Uh, first of all, in terms of the matter under dispute, in commercial arbitrations, as many of you might know, we are dealing with disputes arising out of contracts. So they're mostly commercial in their nature, and therefore we call this commercial arbitration disputes. When it comes to sports, there can be also disputes arising out of contracts, out of contractual commercial relationship, but there are also disputes of different nature. Uh, for example, various disciplinary ethics proceedings. Or violation of certain contractual provisions, but rather violation of certain rules and regulations that apply to athletes and to their sports. Um, this is the first difference. Um, another difference, which I find also is a very important one, relates to consent to arbitration. And that's probably one of the most discussed differences. Uh, in commercial arbitration, we can only arbitrate when there is a consent. It's really the key fundamental feature of any commercial or of any investment arbitration proceedings. There must be a consent. Otherwise, a panel or an arbitrator will not have jurisdiction over a certain dispute. Now, when it comes to sports disputes, um, there might be no voluntary consent, so to say, 
and there is a mandatory consent involved in this type of disputes uh, when an arbitration clause provided, for example, in rules or regulations, and an athlete would like to practice in that area, would like to practice in professional sport, basically there is not much choice but you know, to accept this arbitration provision and to subject his or her disputes in the future to jurisdiction of that particular arbitration institution. Now, of course, this issue has raised a lot of debate and discussions to what extent that legitimate to have that mandatory uh, consent to arbitration. So say Hobson's choice often referred to. And a number of courts, including the Swiss Supreme Court, including the European Court of Human Rights, rule that that is acceptable in sports especially when it comes to disciplinary anti-doping proceedings. So it was already found on numerous occasions that this is fine and this is acceptable. And of course, as I said before, this would not be acceptable in commercial arbitration. This is another key difference. Um, so I already touched a little bit upon the form of arbitration agreement in commercial disputes that would usually be an arbitration clause in a contract or a separate arbitration agreement um, that relates to certain contract out of which a dispute might arise. Now in sports arbitration, again, there can be a contract of course, but also an arbitration clause can be embodied in different regulations and rules uh, to which athletes become subject to. Um, a next important difference, uh, and I find it also important and interesting would be a seat of arbitration, because as we all know, seat determines lex arbitrary procedural law that applies to arbitration. In commercial arbitrations, parties are free to choose a seat of arbitration, depending on their need. That would be again embodied in an arbitration clause agreed upon the parties. Uh, in sports arbitration, when it comes especially to arbitration before the CAS, Court of Arbitration for Sport, um, there is really no room to negotiate what would be the seat of the arbitration, because the seat of the arbitration would be always in Lausanne, in Switzerland, and that's very good for lawyers based in Switzerland, because we are privileged to deal with quite a few uh, disputes coming to CAS, coming to Switzerland, that are governed by Swiss law, because Swiss law applies as lex arbitri to these proceedings. Um, just a remark, of course, a tribunal is free to have hearings elsewhere, as also in commercial arbitration, but the seat, the legal seat was always remained the same, and that's Lausanne in Switzerland. Why is it important? Uh, because then, as I said, Swiss law is lex arbitrary applies, and that means that Swiss courts, when needed, can be also involved in the arbitration for interim measures, for example. The Swiss Supreme Court would be the instance before which an application, a motion to set aside an arbitral award will be filed, uh, different gaps again that are not covered by the cost rules or the regulations applicable to a particular disputes again will be covered by Swiss procedural law that applies. That would be PILA, Private International Law Act in Switzerland. Uh, when it comes to the law of, to the, that applies to the merits, um, the situation is somewhat similar here. Uh, in commercial arbitration, the law of the merits would be the one that would be chosen or agreed upon by the parties. In the absence of an express choice, the arbitral tribunal will seek to determine the implied choice. Um, and in the absence of the implied choice, the tribunal might look at conflict of law rules of the legs arbitrary, or even sometimes might choose the law that it considers appropriate in current circumstances. So there is really like more room, let's say, unless the parties agree to some law to choose different applicable law to the merits. When it comes to class arbitration, again, the default rule would be Swiss law. 
unless the parties agreed otherwise. Uh, but usually from my experience, indeed the Swiss law would be really the law that would apply uh, before the CAS. Um, something um, in addition I wanted to touch base in terms of the difference, the relevance of case law maybe. Uh, in commercial arbitration, um, I mean, there is no arbitral precedent. Of course, uh, in commercial arbitration, we, we can still rely on some precedents if they are published, because most of the cases are not published uh, or like redacted, for example. So it's really not that common to rely on previous arbitral precedents in commercial arbitration, pure commercial matters. In sports arbitration, in cause arbitration, this is much more common because some cases are published uh, and in practice, the parties would really quite often rely on previous cas case law uh, and they're largely used as precedent. Uh, and here, maybe we come to the confidentiality issue because it's really connected. Again, in commercial arbitration, one of the values, one of the key features of commercial arbitration is confidentiality. And that's why the parties choose arbitration on the first place. In sports arbitration, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, again, before the cause, for example, appeal proceedings or anti-doping uh, proceedings, uh, in them, the award is usually published. And it's really common for CAS to publish press releases on the outcome of different cases, uh, summarizing the proceedings, sometimes even an update on what is happening in the case, which of course would be unimaginable in uh, commercial arbitration that by definition is confidential and private. Um, choosing arbitrators, that's another interesting uh, point. Uh, in commercial arbitration, uh, in vast majority, subject of course to certain institutional rules where you would have a close list of arbitrators, the parties are free to choose any arbitrator to adjudicate their dispute. And again, in commercial arbitration, why it's chosen as arbitration, because it gives the parties the right to nominate whoever they want to nominate, whoever they think would be the most appropriate. Now, in cost arbitration, there is a closed list of arbitrators, uh, and only arbitrators from this list uh, can serve as arbitrators in CAS proceedings. Uh, now, there were like, again, like some debates about how fair it is to have just this list of certain individuals and not to have an open free choice of arbitrators, so to say. Uh, and several occasions, and that includes the Swiss Supreme Court and also European Court of Human Rights, uh, the courts decided that that's again, fine, that doesn't violate any rights or due process of the parties because the list is sufficiently broad. Uh, currently, the general list of cost arbitrators includes uh, 367 people. So indeed, that gives some choice. Um, maybe since I'm not going to have a lot of time left, I guess, so another maybe final point uh, to touch base upon would be recognition and enforcement of CAS awards. In commercial arbitration, the awards are mostly in vast majority are enforced through the New York Convention. Of course, it's if it's applicable, but most of countries sign the New York Convention, so that would be the regular mechanism. So in sports arbitration, in practice, CAS awards are rarely enforced through the New York Convention per se, because most of them are not like monetary in nature, so to say, and they are enforced likely through the uh, different federation rules and uh, through the mechanism available within the federation, within the sports community. And that includes also disciplinary proceedings, for example, that are aimed at making sure that a party follows the award. Uh, so this is maybe the key difference. Maybe I didn't mention all of them because of the time constraints, but I tried to point out to the most 
most important in my view. And I would be happy maybe to take any questions that will arise in this regard. Thank you Thank very you. much, Anna, for such a structured and on point uh, explanation. And I can see that there is already a ad hoc discussion in the chat box. And I uh, um, uh, want to encourage all of you to put your questions into the chat box. I can see that there has been one question uh, from one of the participants about whether there is some, whether there are ad hoc arbitrations in sports and Cameron kindly answered that there is an ad hoc panel in the, at the Olympic games. Cameron, maybe you want to elaborate a bit and uh, share any observations. Sure, absolutely. And uh, Anna, thank you uh, for such a, a great introduction and actually comprehensive overview of some of the differences between commercial and, uh, and sports arbitration. So uh, the ad hoc panel uh, is, is another instance of athletes being subjected to arbitration uh, seemingly involuntarily. So if, as, as Anna mentioned, if you want to participate in the Olympic Games, Paralympic Games, other, other sports, you subject yourselves to arbitration in a variety of ways, usually through you know, membership rules or uh, sometimes in the uh, registration form for an event that you might be competing in. And that's certainly the case at the Olympic Games. And I think with each uh, edition of the Olympics, that contract that you have to sign as an athlete, and there's a whole code of conduct uh, contract uh, and a variety of other things, but you say, I will comply with a whole list of rules, including the World Anti-Doping Code, uh, the Olympic Charter, uh, any uh, any other rules that may apply, and you agree that you any dispute that arises in the context of the Olympic Games is decided through arbitration, and and that's been the case since 1996 uh, in Atlanta. That was the first ad hoc panel uh, that was uh, available to uh, to athletes at mandatory, but it you know it it really makes sense because it. There's no other way that realistically that as an athlete or a coach with a dispute at the games, and it might be a doping issue or something else, no court is going to be able to make a decision quickly enough for you as an athlete to perhaps you know, try to get onto the playing field after your, uh, after your uh, dispute has been resolved. So since Rio, there are now two types of panels two cast panels at the Olympics. So there's the ad hoc division and the anti-doping division. And anti-doping, as you would guess from the title, uh, that, that panel decides all of the doping cases at the games. So uh, I was on the anti-doping division at the Olympics in Pyeongchang uh, in uh, 2018. And you know, you, whether you're on that, uh, that panel or ad hoc, at the uh, at the Olympics, you're on uh, you're on call all the time, and uh, the cases essentially have to be decided within 24 hours. So it is uh, it's it's great to be there, you know, an incredible honor. But it's you're there to serve the athletes and to to serve them quickly and just you know decide uh, decide their disputes fairly and uh, and you know based on the evidence that you have so it's it's a really important service to uh, to the athletes and uh, and so that's some of the like the ad hoc panel at the uh, at the Olympics um, on the uh, like on the issue of uh, speed uh, I'll, I'll mention one other uh, perhaps you know, difference between commercial and, uh, and sports arbitrations is that you know, well of course with a commercial arbitration you can have an expedited process but I don't think it really is ever quite as quick as the sports arbitrations can be. And I'll just give you a, a brief example. Uh, I was getting ready to go to Pyeongchang uh, to the Olympics to sit on the anti-doping division. And I got a call from the American Arbitration Association, which hears all of the first instance doping cases in the United States. Uh, they called me at one o'clock in the afternoon and said, oh, uh, hey, would you be available? We might need to have an emergency hearing today. I said, great, yeah, no problem. And they said, and you'll need to issue an operative uh, decision by 2 a.m. because that's when the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee needs to uh, select the team. Like, okay, yeah, sure, uh, I'm ready, let's go. So the, uh, they let me know at about 6 p.m. that a hearing would be necessary. I got the submission and, you know, we're not talking like, 
briefs, like the normal briefs that you might submit in arbitration, but I mean, literally submissions, you know, in emails. So I got the, uh, the documents, the um, information from the athlete's lawyer at about 7.30. USADA was the party on the other side. They gave me their submission. I asked for it by 10 p.m. They said, well, we don't know if we can do that. And I said, okay, uh, I, as soon as I get your papers, I need 15 minutes to read them before the arbitration starts. And that's, you know, that's crazy. Like normally arbitrations take months. So, and you have much more time as an arbitrator to read the papers, but um, the hearing started at 10 PM. We were on the phone and I, I remember exactly when it finished because I thought, oh, I have 49 minutes to decide if somebody goes to the Olympic games or not. Uh, so the, Again, arbitration is so critical in uh, in, in sport with the with the speed, uh, the uh, relatively like low cost to the to the athlete, and having arbitrators like Sylvia and others of us who sit on the court of arbitration for sport with you know, experience uh, experience uh, uh, with, with the with the rules and the the nature of the disputes. So uh, I'll uh, I'll give Sylvia some time to uh, to comment here before we go on to our next question. And, and if anyone has questions, uh, you know, please feel free to uh, put them in the uh, in the chat. Thank you so much, Cameron, a very great addition. Sylvia, would you like to share uh, anything else uh, on the differences? Yes, yes, thank you very much, Anna and, and Cameron, for this, well, not, not just introduction reason, really uh, a big insight into the difference is sport uh, arbitration and commercial arbitration. I want to add some points. Un unfortunately, um, CAS is not always, and, and sports arbitration not also always as fast as the ad, ad hoc uh, division at the Olympics. Uh, sometimes cases are quite long. I'm, I'm very impatient sometimes. So that's one issue I think where we should try to become better in, in sport arbitration. Um, but I want to point especially out two points. The, the reason why we have the differences, uh, as explained by Anna, between commercial arbitration and, and sports arbitration, at, at least the, the main reason for the, most of the cases, is that in commercial arbitration, you have contractual partners, as Anna said, so they are more or less on one level. In disciplinary issues, and that's the majority of issues for, for sports arbitration, especially for CAS, um, you have individuals on the one side and an organization. And sometimes if you, we have an individual on the one side, a football player and FIFA on the other side, there is, they are not on the same level. You have a big, big difference. That's one point. Um, and um, the main point why CAS, I would say, is more an overall system compared to commercial arbitration, where the parties can decide whether they want to have arbitration or no arbitration and which kind of arbitration and so on, um, is that especially within doping cases, you need a level playing field for the athletes and for everybody involved in sport. And if you make it dependent from the individual and the federation, whether they go to a sport arbitration or to somebody else or to whatever institution or national court or whatever, um, you will not have a clear jurisdiction on these cases. And that's why case law is important and why you have to have an overall system if you really want to have athletes and others. That's, that's the next point I will touch on. If you want to have the individuals uh, judged on a, on a fair basis as far as this can be uh, fair. Uh, because otherwise you will have as leads for a doping offense being suspended for two years and others for four years and the next one for half a year. And, and, and so that's something we cannot accept within sport and that would not be a level playing field. With regard to the individuals, I think it's very important that more and more we have cases not just on athletes, but on officials. If it's about corruption, if it's about sexual abuse or harassment, we had big cases recently with CAS, for example, the Afghanistan football president uh, abusing young national players. So there are more and more cases coming. I think it's very important to have an international arbitration court 
judging on that and not leave it up to, to the national courts in a country where maybe the victims will not be supported in a way as they should be. So that's something just developing with, within sport. And I think it's very important to see how we can support, especially athletes, but as well other individuals, to have a fair sports arbitration situation from the national level or the international federation level up to CAS, because quite often in, in CAS decisions I see when if it's an appeal on a decision by an international federation or by a national Olympic committee, for example, quite often I see that the first decision we are, that one that has been appealed, um, well, lacks some formalities, lacks some knowledge, uh, and it is not as uh, highly of quality as we would have liked to, to have it. And, and so it's very important that in the end to have CAS with more and more professional professional arbitration than you have on the national level quite often. And um, my last point is, and that's something what is important CAS in my view has to work on, is the independence of CAS. And uh, that's the question of the ICAS. ICAS is a board that's ruling and, and regulating the CAS itself. So it's the highest executive board of CAS. And there we have the International Olympic Committee uh, represented. We have Sports Federation represent, represented. We have athletes represented, but only <laughs> a, a little bit. So uh, there is a discussion right now going on whether we need more independence regarding ICAS and the overall uh, overview of, of uh, CAS. And this will have an impact, I think, as well on the question how the list of arbitrators is uh, composed and how arbitrators and which arbitrators are appointed to which case. Because from time to time, there is some impact from ICAS or from CAS itself, and it's not just the choice of the parties. So that was my, my input so far. Thank you so much, Silvia, for this very interesting insights about Kitchen of the Cast and various, various uh, interesting uh, cases that occur. And uh, I cannot help noting that we have been talking about Cast a lot in answering the first question, but uh, still we are holding this uh, discussion in the framework of uh, TIAC another arbitration institution, which is also a forum of uh, resolution of sports dispute. And there are other national institutions that uh, decide cases in the field of sports. So how do you think uh, whether they are competitors of CAS or that whether they, whether CAS and national arbitration institutions can complement each other? Celia, would you like to have a first go answering this? Well, um... Regarding doping cases, in the end, it's always CAS. You, you cannot have a national uh, arbitration institution, institution and say we, we don't care for CAS, and, and that's a final decision on, on national level. It's always CAS that's from the WADA code. And uh, so if your country is a signatory, uh, Uzbekistan is a signatory to, to the WADA code, and I assume it is, otherwise you could not compete, or your, your athletes could not compete on the international level, then it's always cast in the end with, with these cases. What I think and what I just said in my, in my first um, uh, input is that we need professional um, uh, and high quality arbitration already on the national level. So as a first instance, the first decision that then can be appealed to CAS, that's very important. And uh, as smaller national federations usually cannot do it themselves, it's better to have something like TAYAC to, to work on that and to do it for the national federations. In Germany, we had, I think in 2007 or 2008, established a new branch with the German arbitration court and it's a German sports arbitration court as part of this overall arbitration court in Germany. And so most of our national federations now have the doping cases directly decided by this German arbitration court and then it goes to CAS if there is an appeal. So um, it has to be complementary if it's just on national level and not on doping cases. You can do it via this in institution, TIIC, or in many cases, the federations do it, do, it, do it themselves. If you have cases, for example, in football, disciplinary cases regarding a match, then in Germany, we have half a million cases per year on all levels, on all leagues in, in German football. 
So no arbitration court and no uh, usual courts can do that. So you have smaller sport arbitration panels in the specific federations on all levels to, to really deal with, with these many cases. But, but it depends on what is the, uh, what kind of a case is it? Is it a national or international? Is it on, uh, on the pitch or is it off the pitch? Is it doping or not doping? Is it a transfer, whatever? So it's the whole system and you have to see what can be the role of a national arbitration court? What will be the role of national federations on all levels with all leagues? And what will be the role of CAS and how it fits all together? Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, Karen, I can see that you are already eager to uh, yeah. add something. <laughs> thanks and thanks, Sylvia, for the uh, the great intro there. Uh, so in uh, in the United States, uh, there are uh, there are two two bodies that hear sports related arbitration. Uh, so the first is the American Arbitration Association, and the AAA hears all first instance doping cases. So the U.S. Anti Doping Agency, anytime they bring a case against an athlete, the athlete has the opportunity for a hearing before the AAA. So that's, uh, and, and the AAA hears all sorts of other arbitration matters as well. Um, you know, commercial uh, construction and any kind of, you know, any kind of other arbitration, but there are uh, specific arbitrators who hear the, uh, who hear the doping cases. So I I've heard a number of those. And actually, when I was practicing law, I, I represented athletes in doping cases. So I, I argued cases before uh, the AAA as, uh, as well. Um, the other, uh, the AAA also hears eligibility cases. So this is, the, the U.S. I think is a little unique in this respect in that we have a federal statute. So passed in 1978, amended in 1998, called the Ted Stevens Olympic and Amateur Sports Act. And one of the uh, one of the things that the statute did when it was originally passed was to require the U.S. Olympic, and now it's the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee, to provide athletes with the swift and equitable resolution of disputes related to their ability to compete. So we call, we call it like the, the right to compete and in international competitions. So for example, and I've, I've heard a number of these cases, um, for example, if an athlete believes that a, let's say like USA Cycling, uh, uh, USA Cycling should have named them to the Olympic team and did not as a result of failing to comply with the selection procedures, the athlete can challenge that decision. And uh, you know, back to the sort of the speed of the decision, if necessary, the, a decision can be rendered within 48 hours uh, through, uh, through arbitration. So that's a, it's a big benefit again for, for athletes and, uh, and coaches. So that's the AAA, so doping and eligibility. And uh, to, uh, to Sylvia's point about you know, abuse cases, which you know, of course we, uh, in the U.S. Sort of are still dealing with the fallout of the USA Gymnastics uh, scandal, um, in part as a result of that, an independent agency, so it's called the U.S. Center for Safe Sport, was designated to hear all abuse cases from national governing bodies. So in the, in the same way that the World Anti-Doping Agency was created to be independent, to harmonize rules, and to uh, you know, apply the same kind of sanctions and uh, make sure that everyone was uh, had the same prohibited substance list. Uh, the U.S. Center for Safe Sport is is basically serving the same purpose. It's it's independent. No longer can USA Gymnastics make a decision about whether a coach or someone else uh, violated an athlete's uh, rights. And it's it's sexual abuse, verbal abuse, physical abuse, any any kind of case like that. Um, is uh, is adjudicated through the U.S. Center for Safe Sport, and if it goes to a hearing, uh, the hearing is by jams, and that's another arbitra you know, arbitration entity. Uh, again, here's commercial cases, but it's been designated to hear uh, any uh, any cases related to uh, abuse in the U.S. Thank you so much, Cameron. Uh, and uh, do you have anything to add? on this one? Yes, very briefly, uh, just to address in the very first issue 
that raised whether national arbitral institutions and costs somehow compete or they're complementary. Uh, in my view, of course, they are complementary. I think CAS uh, is considered to be maybe the Supreme Court for sports cases, but there are like a huge amount of different, of various sports related cases. And honestly, if they would all go to CAS, the CAS would be like overloaded. I don't know, here in thousand cases per day. Uh, this is just not possible, of course. So it's extremely important, I think, also to develop arbitral institutions at the national level that would deal with the type of disputes that Sylvia and Cameron just described and explained. And also there is so many athletes who are not, let's say, international A-level athletes who, whose cases go to CAS, for example, but a vast majority of other athletes, you know, who also need their disputes to be resolved in a proper way. That's why I think it's indeed important to have also a proper institutions with specific training, with specific experience, with specific set of rules that would be competent to resolve such type of disputes in a really proper high quality way. Great, great. Thanks a lot, Anna. Oh, I, I, I can see that there is so much to discuss on each of the topics, but we have to move on, unfortunately. And uh, I, I want to know that sports disputes are not rarely become subject of proceedings in national courts as well, not arbitration. And even in the European Court of Human Rights, uh, various complex problems uh, of human rights uh, come up on many international competitions and raise difficult problems. Sometimes the parties consider that CAS decided the human rights issue incorrectly, probably, and appeal to ECHR. Uh, Cameron, do, do, do you have uh, something to say about this process? Sure, I will be happy to uh, kick off our discussion, uh, noting that I'm probably the only non-European on the uh, on the call, but <laughs> happy to start the discussion. So, uh, as uh, as Jan just uh, mentioned, uh, sport is not free from uh, you know, human rights issues. Uh, and uh, as we see at every Olympic Games and in a lot of competitions and as a rise in many cast decisions. So uh, I'm, I'm going to highlight a couple of, uh, a couple of dis decisions that have been appealed uh, to the ECHR. And, um, and most of the challenges, by the way, have been with respect, and this is, goes back to what Sylvia uh, mentioned about CAS needing to be you know, independent and impartial, and perhaps you know being even more independent and impartial than the than the body uh, currently is. So, uh, and and also just a you know a little context as far as where this occurs in the in the process. Uh, this might be sort of the fourth step in adjudicating a, a dispute. There might be a national level dispute let's say doping at the AAA in the United States, appealed to CAS. Uh, and then as, uh, as Anna mentioned uh, at the very beginning, uh, there can be an appeal to the Swiss Federal Tribunal. And after that, several athletes have appealed their cases uh, to uh, the ECHR. So, uh, so Pechstein, uh, Claudia Pechstein is a, it was an important uh, decision uh, from CAS's perspective uh, since she was a, a, a speed skating athlete who had a positive drug test in 2009 at the World Championships. The International Federation for Skating, the ISU, imposed a two-year ban. She appealed to CAS, and CAS confirmed the decision of the ISU. So she then took that third step and appealed to the uh, Swiss Federal Tribunal, and her, uh, her arguments were you know, that CAS, the members were not independent and impartial, that the president of the panel had already formed a decision about the issue, and that the secretary general of CAS unduly interfered with the, the rendering of the uh, decision. So uh, she did not prevail at the, uh, at the Swiss Federal Tribunal and then took like, actually another step and apply, uh, appealed to the uh, German courts. So uh, the, the lower court um, viewed the, the agreement 
as one, you know, involuntary. She didn't have a decision about whether she agreed to arbitrate her decision, uh, her, uh, her doping uh, dispute or not. Uh, but then that was overturned by the German Supreme Court. So like a lot of uh, procedural history here, but uh, she, she appealed to the ECHR in, uh, in 2010, uh, arguing that their, her right to a fair trial had been violated because uh, the, the cast was not uh, impartial uh, and, and independent. Uh, it did take uh, eight years uh, for a, a decision. So this is perhaps not the most expeditious way to, uh, to resolve uh, disputes, but, uh, but the ECHR said, okay, no, um, no issue with the, the tribunal being independent and impartial. However, because Pakshteen, she asked for a public hearing uh, in her arbitration. And that's, you know, that's not common. Uh, as you know, Anna mentioned at the beginning, confidentiality and uh, the private nature of arbitration applies both in commercial and in sports cases. But uh, the ECHR said, well, actually, uh, because the athletes, you know, wanted the public hearing, that should have been granted. And, and CAST has, uh, CAST has made a uh, a change. Uh, there was a uh, there was a very large uh, public uh, hearing with uh, a Chinese swimming uh, athlete uh, in the in the past year or so. I'm not certain really like what benefit that provides the athlete, but um, it seems now that that is uh, needs is is an option if if both parties agree. So so there was uh, so for Cass, I think that was important that uh, the ECHR confirmed that in fact the the tribunal was was independent uh, and impartial they they made necessary changes to the hearing rules and then um, more recently and I'm sure everyone is uh, somewhat aware at least of the ongoing case of Castor Semenya who is a South African track and field athlete you're running between 800 and uh, or so meters. And Sylvia, that's your event. So um, hopefully you'll have some uh, uh, comments on Castor's case, but uh, Castor Semenya uh, is, is challenging a you know, different, uh, different sort of issues. And this is, this is a little more complicated and I'm, it's gonna be really interesting to see how e, uh, ECHR uh, comes out, uh, uh, but her, she was challenging the rules of world athletics and how it is determined which athletes can compete in the uh, in the women's category. So it's there were rules uh, relating to hyperandrogenism, and now uh, the evaluation is based on differences in sexual development. Uh, but uh, Castor is cha uh, challenging a, a variety uh, of uh, articles, uh, the, including. Uh, the prohibition of inhuman or degrading treatment, respect to right to respect for private life, um, pro prohibition on discrimination, a right to a fair hearing, of course, and then right to an effective uh, remedy. So, uh, so these are, uh, you know, these this is uh, this is uh, ongoing, and um, and Sylvia's got some comments in the uh, in the in the chat there, but it is you know it is another avenue for uh, for athletes to uh, to challenge uh, decisions uh, by uh, by cast. Uh, so I'll uh, I'll stop here and let uh, let my colleagues uh, jump in with any uh, any comments that they have. Thank you, Cameron. And I, I, I think Sylvia has has something interesting to share. So I will pass the floor to her. Well, in, in the chat, I, I answered, but there was another question in between. So it, it crossed one another. I, I answered on, on the situation of the Belarus athlete. Uh, we, we don't have any, any details yet uh, regarding the case. The ad hoc commission had this case. Uh, and they decided that uh, there was no proof of what the athlete said. So, with, but I have no no for, uh, uh, more details. So it's difficult to judge what what really was the case um, that the ad hoc decision uh, um, division had to decide. Um, I think I, I try to go a little bit deeper, analyzing what's happening the last 
years in, in, in recent time re regarding CAS and sport arbitration. In, in my view, we have um, a very fast development of the importance of human rights with the UN guiding principles on, on business and human rights, now as well accepted by FIFA, UEFA, um, IOC, uh, Commonwealth Games Federation and others. Uh, a lot of athletes making pressure, feeling themselves under pressure, and many federations on national level and international level, while um, not uh, um, being um, on the same line with the development. So, so um, CAS and maybe the whole system in some aspects is not anymore fit for purpose. And, and that's why we have more and more uh, appeals to courts outside of, of the sport arbitration. That's, that's my personal analysis. Um, and it's not always a question of formal rights. Quite often, it's a, it's a question of substance, a question of the rules, of the regulations we have in specific federations. If we come to the Casta Semenya case, we have different rules in different international federations how to deal with this situation. It's a very difficult situation. Um, and I think there is no, and even human rights experts say in the end, there is no solution that will make ha happy everybody. It will always be a very difficult decision to, to say, well, with this uh, um, amount of testosterone, you, you can run or you can weight lift. We have just had this situation with Laurel Hubbard now in, in Tokyo, or, or you can't. So um, there is no perfect solution. There never will be, in my view. Um, and um, so it's difficult um, and the way the international or now it's world athletics former it was the international athletics association uh, iaaf uh, the way they dealt with the casta semenian case when it start it started in 2009 at the world championship that was a catastrophe that that was a disaster uh, they didn't really looked onto the person how to support the person in a very very difficult situation it was just no, she, she seems not to be a woman, so we, we have a lot of doubts. And, and then they started with medical uh, um, um, examinations and, and so on. So we know that there has been a lot of, of harm done to, to young women um, and, and, and compete, trying to compete. And um, that's a question not of CAS itself in the end. They can, CAS can, and every sports arbitrator can only decide on the rules they have. And if the sport federations don't have the right rules in place, if they don't develop their rules any further regarding human rights, because we have a totally new situation, uh, totally new discussion uh, since 2011, when the UN guiding principles were uh, approved by the United Nations. So then, even sport arbitration, even CAS has its limits. So we have to see where it's about material rights and where it's about formal rights and where it's about the structure of the overall sport arbitration system. And um, there, I think we have uh, to make some reforms and we should start with that very soon. That's, that's my hope. Thank you, Celia. That's that's very interesting, uh, and uh, I, th I think we all agree that arbitration is a specific institution, and uh, uh, of course, hu human rights issues are, are slightly from different universe, and that's why there might be some inconsistencies in approaches. We have notoriously quick arbitrations in sports area, notoriously long. Uh, proceedings in ECHR. Uh, maybe, Anna, you have also something to share in your opinion uh, on the reform or otherwise? Very briefly, Jan, before we, we, before we go to the next question. Uh, I think the problem here is really what Sylvie mentioned at the beginning, that, you know, not maybe equal level playing field here because we have athletes on one side with their human rights, with their rights for due process, for respect of their procedural guarantees, et cetera. And we have a global sports community. And it's always very difficult to find the balance uh, that would respect properly the human rights and would also you know, ensure uh, how to maintain the integrity of sports, the integrity of clean sports. And then I think this issue you know, need, needs to be resolved. 
in particular, I think that's relevant for the so-called strict liability principle, where it's for the athlete at the end of the day to prove um, that he did not commit an anti-doping rule violation. It's for the athlete to prove that he didn't take a prohibited substance in the anti-doping cases. So because once the substance is found, so it doesn't matter, you know, the level of liability, how it happened, the athlete is considered to be guilty. That's the strict liability. And then the burden of proof shifts to the athlete to demonstrate how the substance got into his body. Uh, and again, the allegations related to anti-doping rule violations in particular with regard to these anti-doping issues, the consequences can be quite severe for the athletes. So that can destroy their career. For an athlete, a career means a life, destroy their life. So the consequences of that could be quite drastic. So the question I think as sports community sports lawyers have to address in the long term, how to deal with this strict liability, the burden of proof on whom it lies, also the standard of proof with regard to the severity with, with regard to the severity of sanctions that such violations can invoke afterwards. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, I, I can say that, that that has been quite quite a passionate uh, speech, and we only have we only have several minutes left. And uh, in conclusion, it would be fun and insightful, I guess, to know a little bit better each of our uh, speakers. And uh, if if you could share some stories from your practice, perhaps, perhaps the most difficult or the most interesting case or some interesting situation. Uh, and uh, I don't want to control this. Uh, whoever wants to be the first, please step up and share. Okay, I can see Cameron. Okay, I'll go. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm going to just briefly a, a case actually uh, before I was an arbitrator. Uh, so I was representing athletes in, in doping cases and I represented an American uh, Olympic gold medalist, uh, Christy Gaines in the very first ever case USADA brought against an athlete without having a positive test. Uh, so it was the first non-analytical positive. And you know, normally these arbitrations even like the doping cases, maybe three to four months if it's on sort of a normal track. This was a full on litigation. It took 16 months. We were having, um, there was a federal criminal uh, uh, case going on in, in parallel, not with my client, but Barry Bonds of the US government was trying to convict him of uh, having used steroids. So it was so complicated, professional sports, Olympic sports, you know, not just an arbitration, but federal courts uh, responding to you know motions and flying to california like within days and it's uh it was complicated it was and that is it was like a much more complicated case than uh, i have seen uh since and that was my i was a, a third year associate uh, uh lawyer so it was uh it was definitely a, a learning experience but i i mentioned that case because uh in in doping the uh the anti-doping agencies really uh, need to rely on other means of catching athletes who are cheating aside from just positive tests. So now we've got the athlete biological passports and you know, a variety of other ways to, uh, to try to catch the athletes who are intentionally cheating, including a basically a 10 year statute of limitations so that the anti-doping agencies can go back and, uh, and retest. But for sure, that was the most complicated uh, and, and probably interesting case that I had as a, as a practitioner. Thank you, Cameron. As I said, I'm not imposing who's next. Please decide it yourselves. Okay, I can go ahead. I was so passionate about the last topic because I mostly represent athletes uh, before tribunals. Um, it's, it's really hard for me to select the most interesting case. Um, I would say, you know, recently, um, two most interesting cases I was involved in were Vada versus. Uh, 
cases, as well as the previous case where my firm represented 39 Russian Sochi Olympic athletes against International Olympic Committee. Um, and maybe I'll mention the latter. Uh, it was a very complex case. And those of you who are familiar with the so-called Russian doping scandal, where Professor McLaren and Dr. Rochenkov put a number of allegations against individual Russian athletes who participated in the Sochi Olympic Games. Um, now, uh, the IOC created a commission, a disciplinary commission within itself that was headed by Dennis Oswald. Uh, and Dennis Oswald considered the cases of these Russian athletes and decided that all of them were guilty, that the allegations put forward by McLaren and by Rochenkov can be relied on. Now, the sanctions that the IOC uh, imposed were quite drastical for these athletes. So basically, all their medals that they gained at the Sochi Games, all their awards were all disqualified, all their results were disqualified, and they were all banned for life to participate in any future editions of Olympic Games. So that basically completely destroyed their previous career and their future career. Uh, now, we appealed these decisions of the IOC before CAS, uh, and the case was quite complex and quite difficult. And the difficulty was also that it had to be resolved within a very short period of time. Basically, we had three weeks before the games in Pyeongchang started. Uh, because we wanted to make sure the athletes can also have a chance to go to the games. But our first aim was really to appeal and to clear these athletes before the cast. Uh, and we managed. Uh, we managed to clear 28 Russian athletes completely. So the decisions of the IOC were completely overturned. Their medals were returned to them. The Russia became again on the top of the medal ranking of the Sochi Games. Uh, and for 11 athletes, the lifetime bans were also overturned. So that was a very good outcome for the athletes. And I definitely find this case one of the most rewarding cases in my career. Thank you, Anna. And Sylvia, would you share, please, your story with us? Well, I think we don't have so much time left. I'm quite happy about that because I don't have this one very interesting case. I was thinking about it beforehand, but, but nothing came to my mind. But I may just refer to, to what Anna said. And again, we have been discussing on athletes and it's true the majority of cases at CAS and uh, on the levels below that are about athletes. But what is really missing as well in doping cases is looking at the officials and those around the, the athletes. Because uh, if you look into cases we have, in, I, I don't mention any country, but if you look into cases and what has been established by, by WADA or others, and, and then um, as, uh, as a factual background um, in, in the decision, um, you have really officials, coaches, presidents of federations, whatever, national Olympic committees and others being behind the doping situation in several countries. Uh, you have a sophisticated system, for example, blood doping an athlete cannot do him, him or herself. You need doctors, you need a whole logistic for that. And that one athlete cannot have uh, an organized by, uh, by him or herself. So what we don't have are at least some more cases on officials, on federations. If you look into the situation of the International Weightlifting Federation, with the president, former president Gunnar for doping situation, you have it in, had it in, in other federations. So I think the prevention and as well as the repression and, and the decisions on, on doping cases have to look more on, on the officials, on the federations, on the structure, on everything, and not just onto, onto athletes. That's something I think we have to work on too. Thank you very much, Celia. Thanks to all the speakers. I've been listening to you very carefully, but I will definitely watch the recording again once it is available because there's been so much interesting stuff in here. Uh, uh, and I'm very delighted that we got such an interesting discussion. And you know, uh, many people say that sport is a sublimation of war. 
and court battles are also sublimation of war. So uh, this, these two are quite, quite close to each other. But I want to think that although sport is a competition, it is also a celebration of people's talents, devotion, strength and integrity. And sports arbitration is an instrument to assist the sports in continuing to be such a, I would say, manifestation of these qualities. So it's great that we have gathered. Uh, I think the recording will be available. So many others who could not join will be able to watch uh, again. Uh, and in conclusion, uh, I, I want to say that please stay tuned for the Spotlight Series webinars and check out the announcements of the Uzbek Arbitration Week, which is going to be in event in one of the days. So we'll hope to see you all uh, there. Otherwise, I hope meeting you all in person some, sometimes when, when uh, the situation uh, improves. Thanks, uh, Sylvia, Cameron, and Anna, and thanks to all the attendees and Tashkent International Arbitration Center, of course, as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, so Thank much. you to everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Nice day to all. Bye.